Uh, I'm actually excited to get going on this lecture because there's a bunch of stuff in here that I think is really, really important for us to get our heads around, especially as we talk about Christian ethics. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is reflect on Augustine and his framework for thinking about Christian ethics. That's, uh, that's this kind of point. We'll get into that in a second. Then we're going to go from there to spend some time unpacking how the image of God impacts how we hear and attempt to follow the Sermon on the Mount. And then the last piece is we're going to talk about how Russ's handout and the kind of the history of Christian ethics, okay? So that's probably, there's no way you're going to be able to do that the whole time. Uh, <laughs> let's get, get to it there. Uh, but that's what we're doing, all right? That's kind of big picture. That's where we're going. That's our pattern. And so for those of you guys who are really locked in already, you may recognize this pattern as almost exactly what it is you did uh, for your Sermon on the Mount passage, right? That we're going to start here talking about Augustine and his work on the Sermon on the Mount. And then we're going to move into how the image of God impacts that. And that will help us make sense out of how we're supposed to live. Uh, anyway, by doing that, I wanted to show you this pattern because my hope is that by modeling for you what that can look like, uh, it'll open up some connections between the work you've already done and uh, kind of the choices you have in front of you uh, that you get to make. So as we begin to do that, let's go ahead and pray together first. So join me in prayer, if you would please. Commanding, suffering, modeling, living God. You took on flesh and walked among us. You taught us the right ways to live and modeled for us what life might look like. Despite all of the commands and instructions, we cannot seem to get out of our own way. We are a violent people raised in a violent city in the heart of a violent country surrounded by a violent world. We are enamored with money and success because it feels more real than you do. We've become, we've become experts at using each other in imbeciles in acting in acts of enjoyment. Surprised by our own stumbling, staggering, and ultimately failing staff at building meaningful lives without you, we finally submit, Lord. Teach us God to be fully alive in your spirit through your Son. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's take a quick uh, walk down memory lane. The last time we gathered like this as a lecture, uh, I told you that the primary <coughs> task of Christian ethics is to recognize the normative role of Jesus' life and teachings for the Christian life. Right? This is what Christian ethics is. It's recognizing and placing Jesus at the very center of everything that Christians do and think and act. Right? That's the point. Uh, you guys will remember that, I think, from the last time. That was our primary kind of thesis. Now, uh, for our sake today, we're going to continue a step further on that. Right? All I did was kind of introduce that point last time. Now we're going to go further, and we're going to start with the Sermon on the Mount. So let's begin, in the Sermon on the Mount, we'll begin with sex. All right, in the Sermon on the Mount, there's actually very little about sex directly, right? You guys colored the, the themes, you guys know what's in the Sermon on the Mount, and very little of it is Jesus actually talking about sex. Jesus does, however, say a ton about marriage and divorce, and these are sort of sex adjacent, right? Like they're connected to it, but not exactly about sex. And then Jesus also has a bit to say about lust and looking at others to lust after, right? This is... Uh, this is kind of the clearest thing Jesus says about this stuff. Uh, Augustine, right off the bat, makes an important point that there's a difference between looking at someone and lusting and looking at someone to lust. All right? Uh, if you want to imagine that point, uh, there is a knee-jerk sort of automatic biological response to somebody that you find attractive, right, that you might consider as lust that happens instinctively immediately, right? The danger for you is when that lingers, or you look at someone specifically to do that, right? That's Augustine's distinction, uh, and I think it's an important distinction, right? You can argue with him whether he's right or not about it. I think he's probably right. I mean, it's Augustine after all, right? Um, but, uh, but that distinction is actually just a, a recognition of what Augustine tends to do. Augustine's actually really, really important for Christian thought. For, for Christians still, because he tends to give us a framework to start to make sense out of the world around us. Um, I'm going to try to unpack some of that framework for you so you can understand better how to read and think about Augustine. Uh, his most important distinction is probably what we would call the city of God and the city of man. Uh, in a book called The City of God, which is Augustine's probably most important work, uh, in Latin it's called uh, De Civitate Dia, is uh, what you would largely imagine it is, right? The city of God is 
the place, times, and more importantly, the actions that are aimed at and directed towards God's city, towards God's rule and reign in the world. Right? This is uh, Augustine recognizes that there is there are two different ways of being in the world, and one of them is oriented towards the city of God, and one of them is oriented towards the city of man. And in the city of man, man rules, right? Man is in charge, and by man he just means humanity here, not men specifically. Although you guys know that largely in history it has been men, right? Uh, for mostly worse. Uh, the, so this is the city of man, right? Uh, Augustine's gonna say that all cities that are cities of men, which is literally every city, are founded in murder, they're built on blood, and they're places of vengeance. Right? This is how Augustine thinks of the city. Uh, as opposed to that, we have something like the city of God, which is uh, God's rule, God's reign being manifest and being made clear. And for Augustine, the clearest example of the city of God is found in the sacraments. Right. So we looked at these sacraments last year, you guys know them, but if you think of the Eucharist in particular, this is the primary dominant one Augustine has in mind when he's talking about the city of God, is how do we become oriented and live in proximity to this, to the Eucharist, to this act of thanksgiving, to be being fed by the body and blood of Jesus. So God's clearly present there. He's ruling his kingdom. He's working in significant ways. That's the city of God, right? Um, on the flip side is the city of man, which we mentioned already. Um, the primary examples for this might be something like the seven deadly sins that we looked at last year. In clear-cut, obvious cases, right? So there's cases like the Eucharist. There's cases like murder. It's easy to see how one is oriented towards one or the other, right? Like in the, in the extremes, that's really obvious. The problem is most of us don't live in the extremes most of the time. So it's hard to tell when we're oriented towards the city of God and when we're oriented towards the city of man, right? This is the, this is the distinction Augustine's making. So we want to catch both of those. Okay, with that in mind, uh, I want to say one more thing about this city of God, city of man. It's easy when I give you that explanation to think that the city of God exists in one place and the city of man exists in another place, but that's not actually how Augustine's thinking about it, right? They, they overlap and they are existent. Uh, the city of God especially is always present. So I'm gonna draw a picture for you. Uh, this picture some people find helpful, some people do not find it. If you don't find it helpful, it doesn't make you dumb and it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Uh, just, just so you can see, if, if you imagine two triangles sort of uh, laying on top of each other, like this. That's close. I almost got a triangle. Uh, so uh, if you imagine the city of man and the city of God, right? So I'll just write that in. My marker's failing me already. All right. So the city of man, I've described it to you, right? This is a, this is a city that's built on blood. It's built on violence. It's built on murder. It's aimed at humanity and not at God. The city of God is the opposite of that. If you have this in your head, what do you think the one event that Augustine would say is the single greatest example of the city of man? Like, what's the pinnacle of the city of man? Can you think of an event in history that Augustine might put here? Crucifixion. Yeah, the crucifixion. That's exactly right, right? So for, uh, for Augustine, there's no point in human history that's more clearly the fullest, like you can see how this triangle is like completely full here, right? Like there's no sense in which uh, there's no moment in history where this triangle is more complete or more full than in the crucifixion of Jesus, right? At this moment in time, humanity kills God, right? This is the this is this is how Augustine's going to interpret this, right? That this that Jesus himself, uh, the city of man wins, right? Like that's pretty clear. Uh, they killed Jesus. That's there's not a bigger win for the city of man than that. But Augustine's also going to point out the really obvious thing here, right? Which is this city, this this crucifixion is actually the way the city of God grows, right? This is the means by which God brings about redemption for the whole world. So at the moment that the city of man thinks it's it's won everything it can win, it's done the thing it was meant to do, this moment of crucifixion, at exactly that moment, the city of God is still present, right? And not only is it present, but it becomes the seeds and the basis for all the things that the city of God is going to accomplish in the world. So this is the way Augustine thinks about the city of God versus the city of man, that even in the city of man's strongest, boldest, biggest thing, the city of God is still present, right? Not only is it present, but it's present in actively subverting what's happening in the city of God. So that's a, if you have that in your head when you think about the city of man and the city of God, the city of God is always present, right? It's not, 
It's, it's never not existing. Okay, one more thing from Augustine here before we move on to this last important part. Uh, for Augustine, we still got a ways to go in the lecture, sorry guys. Uh, this helps us understand another piece to Augustine's thinking, which is what he calls ordered loves. Um, I'm gonna write it in red because my blue one's not up. So, uh, ordered loves is really, really foundational in understanding what Augustine's about. And for ordered loves, if you can keep this distinction in your head, there are things and ways that we love. He wants to say there's a hierarchy of love, right? So that, um, I'll give you a really dumb example, but I love pizza and I also love my wife. Mm. And I also love my mom, right? Oh. I do not love all three of them the same way, right? There's a hierarchy to that love. And if you think pizza's first, that's just because you know I'm fat, and that's not fair. I don't appreciate that. All right, Damn. all right. But so, but you see, like if you guys have this, right? There are things you love, and there are people you love. But there's a hierarchy to love. Augustine's going to say there's only one true love, and that love is aimed at God. Okay. So when you think of the order of love, all love starts in God, because God is the center of all of that, and then we order our love based on proximity to God. You guys understand what I'm saying here? So God becomes a central piece. Everything else is going to be a love that comes off of that. It's the same thing here, right? The city of God is the right ordering of those loves. The city of man is the wrong ordering of those loves. Right? So for Augustine, these are going to be connected pretty clearly. I'm going to give you a quote from Augustine that you may want to jot down. Um, <clears throat> it, this is a, a simple Augustine phrase, but it's this. Uh, ordered love... So what he's talking about here is the brief and true definition of virtue. Ordered love, I'll repeat it again for you. Ordered love is the brief and true definition of virtue. We're not going to spend a ton of time on virtue today, but we're going to come back to that in our next lecture, okay? But I want you to have that in your head, that Augustine believes if you get these, these loves right, if you order them in the right way, that is what virtue is, right? That's what virtue That's virtuous. Once you love the right way, all the other actions towards the city of God and city of man are going to follow naturally. Right? Getting those loves ordered the right way, wanting the right thing in the right way, that's the key to the Christian life. Okay. So we have this sort of two city stuff, we have this ordered love stuff to help us make sense of the teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. But how does it actually do that? The answer is it doesn't exactly, right? But it sets us up to hear the piece from Augustine that is going to help us make more sense of it. And this, is, this one is maybe the more interesting one. So while Augustine set up this framework of ordered loves, and remembering that, that the love of God is the true higher, highest love, right? It's the only real love. He wants to say something else. And he's going to make this point that there's two kinds of things in the world. There's things that are meant to be enjoyed. And there are things that are meant to be used. Just for the fun of it, here's some Latin for you. Some of you guys might enjoy this. Um, enjoyed is frui in Latin, and used is yukai. Uh, we use this one still, like if you think of utilize or utility, these are just words that come from the Latin for used. They just build up there. Um, but the point here is that Augustine has this idea that some things are meant to be used, some things are meant to be enjoyed. The things that are meant to be used are meant to lead us to enjoyment. Okay? They're meant to build us up into this hierarchy of ordered loves that he has, right? Remember, God being the, the ultimate center point of these loves. Things that are meant to be used are meant to be used to push us towards that enjoyment, right? And things that are meant to be enjoyed, in this case, God himself, uh, that's the highest of loves. And the point here is this. For Augustine, things that are meant to be used are meant to be used and discarded. This is one of the distinctions. Things that are meant to be enjoyed last forever. The enjoyment of something never goes away. All right? That's a, that's a key piece for Augustine. Um, so things that are meant to be used, you can think of any examples you want, but you might think of like Kleenex or toothbrush or cologne or something, right? Like you use that. Right, here's a really dumb example I used last class. I should probably come up with a better one, but I didn't think about it until right now, so I didn't. Uh, your deodorant, right? It might be that you're meant to be in a relationship with somebody that you enjoy, 
in the way Augustine's defining enjoyment, right? Um, but you smell really bad. That's possible. I've met some of you, um, right? So you buy deodorant, and deodorant is used by you to help you be enjoyed by somebody else. Whoa. Right? Do you understand the point? <laughs> Sorry, Lily. Don't take that person. All right. Uh, but you get the point here, right? You, you guys are tracking? Yeah. Okay. So, what does this have to do with the Sermon on the Mount? Excellent question. I should have thought of that before I started talking. Um, I do want to remind you of the quote from the Do Not Today, though. Actually, uh, yeah, to enjoy a thing is to rest with satisfaction in it for its own sake. Why does Augustine say that? I tried to mention this. Because this is the highest love you can have. To love something just for that thing, right? To love someone just for them. That's the highest form of love there is, according to Augustine. Let me read you another quote from Augustine on this. To enjoy something is to hold fast to it in love for its own sake. <clears throat> to use something is to apply whatever it may be to the purpose of obtaining what you love. If indeed that thing is something that ought to be loved in the first place. Okay. When we recognize ordered love, particularly this point, that God is the one to be most truly enjoyed in our world, to be most truly loved, we can now make the connection to the Sermon on the Mount. The connection is this. Jesus' teaching about divorce and marriage and about lust are key examples of people using people instead of enjoying them in the Augustinian mm. sense. Right? When you lust after someone, you're using that person. When you divorce someone, you're using that person. When you commit adultery on someone, you're using that person and maybe the person you're committing adultery with, right? You're not enjoying the person in the way God designed them to be enjoyed. How does that work? It's connected to the image of God, right? That God has placed his image in us, and because of that for Augustine, that means people are meant to be enjoyed, right? In the same way God is meant to be enjoyed. That we're meant to love each other only for the sake of loving each other, not for what we can get out of that world. Right? We're not meant to use people to get to some other version of love. Right? We're just meant to love. When you have that framework in your head, Jesus' teaching on lust and adultery and divorce makes way more sense. Because what's happening in those situations, when you look at someone to lust after them, is you're blotting out the image of God from them. By objectifying them, by turning into some sort of object that you can use, like you would use a Kleenex or a toothbrush, means you're not recognizing God in them. Right? You're blotting out the image of God in those people. And when you do that, when you short-circuit the enjoyment you're supposed to have, and instead focus on the utility of the person, you not only destroy the image of God in them, you actually send your own life into disorder and chaos. By ignoring God in the other, it's impossible to follow Jesus' teachings. And it also opens up a whole world of destructive and death-filled behavior around sex. Right? This is, when we talk about the themes from the Sermon on the Mount, this is how the theme of sex gets used. I think this is what Jesus is doing. I think Augustine helps us see that. Augustine's use of verses, or Augustine's use versus enjoy distinction also gets at the heart of Jesus' teaching on violence. It's the same argument, right? If looking at someone in lust blocks out the image of God, how much more so does wanting to kill or violate them in anger? Right? Do you see the, the connection here? Like if, if just looking lustfully at somebody blocks out the image of God, me killing them certainly blocks out the image of God, right? Me wanting to kill them or be angry with them clearly does that. So for Augustine, following Jesus, we must be willing to risk the image of God in us before we would ever imagine erasing it in somebody else. This is one of the great problems with the way we think about violence and vengeance, is that we're, we're fine with holding onto the image of God for us, but we have no problems blotting it out in somebody else. This is, to Jesus, this, is, this doesn't make any sense at all. Right? And Augustine's going to agree with him on this. Lastly, Augustine's definition of ordered loves helps us get our heads around Jesus' teaching about treasure. The nature of treasure, according to Jesus, is to force us to serve it. Um, or, as noted hip-hop philosopher, the notorious B.I.G., points out, 
more money and more problems, right? Money tends to move us from something that is meant to be used to build the city of God, right? This is what it's for. Money should be here, right? It should be used. But what we do with money when we treasure it is we make it something we try to enjoy. But it's not meant to be enjoyed. And so when we do that, it becomes disordered. Instead of us, instead of money serving us and the kingdom of God, it becomes something that we end up giving our entire lives to serve. And when we do that, our lives fall apart. Jesus is very clear about which follows which in his sermon. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. One of the most dangerous things we do with money is we get the order wrong. We think that our hearts lead us and the money will go anywhere our heart is. But it's the other way around. Your heart will follow your wallet. If you want to care more about poor people, guess what? Start giving them money you will automatically begin to care about them more. There's a bad example of this too. This is not me endorsing this example. I'm just going to give you a bad one. If you want to enjoy sports more, start betting on them. Right? Your heart will follow your money. Now, that's not an endorsement of sports gambling, so don't do that. Um, but get the point, right? Your heart will follow your money. Okay, that's Augustine's language on this stuff. This is the framework I want you to have to be able to understand what Augustine is doing. City of God... Ordered loves, enjoy versus use, okay? And while that helps us make sense on the Sermon on the Mount and the ethical commands of Jesus, I think once we have that framework in place, we're able to start going a step further now. Um, and we can answer a question, that sort of, a question that sort of hangs over the Sermon on the Mount all the time, right? And it's this. Are you even able to live the life Jesus commands you to live in the Sermon on the Mount? As some of you guys were reading yours as you were interpreting it, you started to realize this stuff is really hard. Right? Are we even supposed to be able to do this? Are we even capable of doing the sort of thing that Jesus called us to do here? <clears throat> In short, I think the answer to that question is yes. You are supposed to live the Sermon on the Mount. Right? And I think the key to understanding how you're supposed to live the Sermon on the Mount is found in the image of God language. So I want to unpack that a little bit further. The starting point for speaking well of the image of God and making sure we know what we're talking about is to start by recognizing Jesus as God. This is the theological category of incarnation. We talked about this before, right? Carne means flesh. That's where we get even carne asada from, right? Uh, it means to have flesh on you, right? This is the incarnation. It reveals to us deep truth about the image of God. We've all been created in the image of God, and I believe Martin Luther King Jr. is right that it's something inherent in all humanity. To be human is to have something about us, injected into us, according to Martin Luther King Jr., or in our coding, or whatever it is, that reflects who God is. But that statement in and of itself is not big enough, or it's too big, to really get at a point that's helpful for us. So we want to nuance it a little bit. So the image of God does not mean that if you look at me, you can figure out who God is. Okay, this is actually a really dangerous point. God doesn't look like me. I have something in me that is put there by God. That's what the image of God means. The point of this is, even if you tried to do that, the only way you could ever get close to it, probably, is through something like Aquinas' uh, negative reasoning, which if you're interested in that, we can talk about it more, but that's, uh, Aquinas would say, you could, you could reason backwards to what God is by looking at your opposite almost, right? Um, so I'm petty and lazy. God might not be petty or lazy, right? Like that would be kind of the way Aquinas would go about doing it. And so I do agree with a number of you, I looked at your papers on this stuff, that how you embody the image of God, the choices and actions we make, can make that image clearer or can obscure it, right? Um, that is true, right? But that's not connected to not having the image of God or having it. That's the image that we already have. Can we make that clearer or less clear? clearer or more obscure, and I think we probably can. Karl Barth reminds us of another piece to this, which is actually an important thing to nuance also. Namely, that none of us embody the image of God alone. Right? When we talk about the image of God, and we talk about you being made in the image of God, that's all true, but you're not the image of God by yourself. Right? Even in Genesis, when God creates humanity, God creates male and female in his image. He does it together, right? So all of humanity together are made in the image of God, and it's a communal quality, and that's all true. All of it's, I think, exactly right, except for one enormous exception. And that exception 
is Jesus. I want you to think about this for a second, because the incarnation means that Jesus is both God and made in the image of God. Jesus is God and made in the image of God, which is sort of wild when you start to think about that a little bit, right? Um, and here's one implication for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, who is God and the image of God, proclaims in the Sermon on the Mount how we're meant to live in this incredibly strange way that's so strange that at least three of the gospel writers reference Jesus's authority in teaching, and all of the gospel writers go to length to demonstrate Jesus' singularity as a teacher. Right? This strange way of living is somehow connected to this strange teacher that we have. And Jesus lays it out in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's so strange sometimes that this is what sparks even the question we're having about whether we can even follow it now. And the question following the Sermon on the Mount, then, whether we can follow it or not, has to be answered in at least two clear ways based on this from Jesus. The first way is from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who reminds us that the Sermon on the Mount is fundamentally about Jesus. First and foremost, everything else is about Jesus and ordering our lives around him. He's going to follow Augustine in this sense, right? He's going to have the same idea that our loves and our lives must be ordered in this way where Jesus is primary. In his section on lust, Bonhoeffer says this, No sacrifice is too great if it enables us to conquer a lust which cuts us off from Jesus. Both eye and hand are less than Christ, and when they are used as the instruments of lust and hinder the whole body from the purity of discipleship, they must be sacrificed for the sake of Jesus. Whether we agree with Bonhoeffer entirely or not, and whether you follow the Sermon on the Mount or not, what is at stake here in this teaching is Jesus. Right? This is the part that matters. These are not questions in the Sermon on the Mount about being nicer or about being a better person, or about being a good citizen, or about being a nice member in a church, or any of that stuff, or whether you like it or don't like it, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' way of giving us himself. As God in flesh, as someone made in the image of God, Jesus is showing us what it looks like to live with God. The second answer to the question of the Sermon on the Mount is meant to be followed if it's meant to be followed, is that Jesus seems to think so, right? Jesus, over and over again, gives these commands, but he doesn't just give these commands, he also follows them. I mean, I want you to think about this from the Sermon on the Mount, because this is actually one of those pieces that can unlock a few other things for us. Jesus does not just tell you to turn the other cheek when somebody punches you. He literally allows himself to be crucified. Jesus doesn't just tell you to forgive your brother or sister or love your enemies or pray for those who persecute you. He actually forgives them. And he asks for their forgiveness on the cross. And then he makes that forgiveness possible in his death. Jesus doesn't just tell his disciples to not trust in money or treasure. Jesus simply and completely trusts God all the way to and through the cross. <clears throat> in Jesus' incarnation and embodying the image of God, we can see that not only is the Sermon on the Mount meant to be followed as a way to Jesus, it's meant to be followed as the way of Jesus. Right? The Sermon on the Mount is both the way to get to Jesus, and it's also the way of Jesus. It's how he wants you to live. Okay, so how do we get from all of that stuff with the Sermon on the Mount and the image of God to this How Are Us handout? And this is our last piece, and we'll close on this, this section. How do we get from the Sermon on the Mount to the cross to the here, from the Sermon on the Mount to the cross to here and now? Um, these handouts from How Are Us, these are, there are two absolutely and crucial ideas that are connected to each other that we want to catch from these handouts. All right, uh, the first one in How Are Us, we're telling the history of Christian ethics. The first key idea is that all Christian ethics is actually theology. Right? All Christian ethics is actually theology. At no point when thinking, writing, or discussing Christian ethics are we doing anything other than the work of theology. Um, to get your head around this point, to understand what he's naming here, I want to backtrack to my last lecture. In that lecture, I situated ethics as a branch of philosophy and Christian ethics as a subset of ethics. Right? Remember, philosophy has these branches. One of them is ethics. Ethics has these subsets. One of those might be Christian ethics, right? Uh, just so we can kind of get our heads around it. <clears throat> and now while that is a way of getting our bearings around the discipline of Christian ethics, Aurus is going to challenge that exact claim. Right? He's going to say that all that stuff I just showed you about philosophy and these branches is actually maybe not true at all. 
the framework goes a bit like this, so you can understand his point. The framework goes a bit like this. Philosophy is largely concerned about wisdom and knowing, and wisdom and knowledge for all people across all time. So an important question for philosophy is something like, how do we know what we know? Or, how can I know anything at all? This is epistemology, right? This is one of the branches. This is one of the branches we looked at last time. Or, a different one might be, what is good? Right? Or what is the best thing to do for the most people? That's Kant's uh, ultimate imperative, or categorical imperative. If you looked at the article closely, he, he footnotes this at one point near the end. But Kant's uh, famous for this categor categorical imperative, which is, what's the most good I can do for the most people? Whatever that answer is, that's the thing you're supposed to do next. That's the ethical mandate, right? Alaris is going to say, none of that's actually all that interesting. That might be ethics, that might be philosophical ethics, but that's not what Christian ethics is. He doesn't deny that these categories exist or that philosophy does something important, but what he does say is that Christian ethics is not a version of that. Contra philosophy, Christian ethics is not concerned with all people across all time. It is first and foremost concerned with the reality of who God is, particularly as that reality has been incarnated in the life and teaching of Jesus from Nazareth, who is the Christ. This is, Powers is going to say this over and over and over again. He's just not interested in anything that's not about Jesus. To quote Howard, summing up the work of Karl Barth, and this was from our Do Now the other day, theology is the exposition of how God's word found in Jesus Christ provides not only its own ground, but the ground for all we know and do. Right? For our purposes, to really get our heads around the point that Howard is making, I want to propose this working definition. Theology is what is true of God. All right? That's not true all the time. There's good theology, there's bad theology, all that kind of stuff. But this is what Howarus means a lot of times when he's talking about theology in these essays. He's saying theology, he means what is true about God. All right. So that definition is a helpful one to know. Okay, that's the first idea. That all Christian ethics is actually theology. It's rooted and grounded in who God is. And then that sets up this second point, which is what does it mean to be God's people? Right? The second key idea is that all theology can only be done well within a worshiping community called church. Right? Uh, when we hold these two ideas together, uh, we can start to understand Howarus's essay. His essay is a brief attempt to name the history of Christian ethics through Christian thinkers and developments. The choice of the thinkers he picked is intentional because they are specifically thinkers that are often used to argue against Howarus's main two points. These two points, right? That all Christian ethics is theology, and all theology is actually church work. To put it a slightly different way, in order to do Christian ethics, which is simply good theology, we must submit to the community known as church. The attempt to live good lives or to be good people outside any community committed to that goodness, captured in the Sermon on the Mount, is a colossal waste of your life. This is how Russ's point, even if it doesn't come through super clearly in that essay. The idea of individual autonomy, your personal freedom, or maybe in the language of Disney, following your heart, is actually antithetical to, to the Christian ethic found in the Sermon on the Mount. It's an enormous misunderstanding of the fundamental task of Christian ethics, which is namely to live with Jesus as the norm for human flourishing. Okay, there's still a ton of stuff to be done, but we have two more lectures to get to those things. So for now, we're going to finish up with these. I'm going to give you a quick working definition of the church that combines these pictures together. And then I'm going to tell you a short story and give you an idea to kind of finish on that we'll leave you with, okay? Christian ethics is the work of the church. And at its best, here's a definition for you. The church is a collection of people committed to the city of God, using Augustine's language, right? Enjoying each other. Ordering our lives, or ordering our loves, and recognizing the image of God in all people. The church, I'll read that part one more time. Uh, Christian ethics is the work of the church, and at its best, the church is a collection of people committed to the city of God, enjoying each other, ordering our loves, and recognizing the image of God in all people. The church practices the Sermon on the Mount as a way of life, and confesses her failings to each other, and to God while practicing the forgiveness Jesus has made possible. Here's the deal. The more true that is, 
the more your life will make sense as ordered around the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus. Right? The more true it is that Jesus becomes the norm for your life. I'll finish with this last story in terms of like functionally how this can work. Because right? one of the things we run into all the time is we're always trying to make these choices and make sense out of what's happening around us. Here's one piece. Um, you guys know what's going on in Israel, right? Palestine and Israel. There's fighting. People want you to pick different sides. People want you to go in different places and do different things. And all of that's what it is, right? Um, you have to decide, how am I going to make these choices, right? How am I going to know what to think about what? And you have to submit to certain authorities in your life to be able to do that, right? Whether that's your own authority, right? Whether you're like, I can decide this stuff. I can get enough information, and I can make these choices myself. That's one way people do it, right? Whether it's, I'm just going to believe everything CNN tells me, or maybe worse, I'm going to believe everything Fox News tells me, or maybe worse still, I'm going to believe whatever Twitter says. Right? Like, I don't know how it is you go about knowing your information that you know. Okay, But here's what I'm going to give you as a possible alternative to all of that, based on what we just talked about. Your most reliable way of beginning to think and process these kinds of stories and information is to find someone who practices this life with Jesus that we've been talking about the whole way through, right? So for example, in Jerusalem, there are bishops and priests and pastors who meet every Sunday and pray together. And they take Eucharist together, and they gather around the same Christian Eucharist table that we gather around. And they eat together and drink together and try to figure out what does it mean to live peaceably. Those voices are the voices we ought to be prioritizing when we talk about these stories. How do they tell us to respond to Jerusalem? I don't care how Democrats or Republicans tell you how to respond to Jerusalem. I do care how priests in Jerusalem tell you to respond. Right? You see the difference between those two things? Okay, that's where we'll close today. Uh, anybody have any questions? Anything you want me to clear or go back over? Will these be posted on Sleepy? The lectures? Yeah. Uh, probably at some point. You can ask Jimmy or, uh, or Eric maybe. Uh, they're not posted yet. I don't know when they'll get posted, so it might be posted after the quiz. I'm not positive. All right, we quiz next Wednesday. You guys have the rest of the class. Get back to class, please.